<laughs> it's too quiet. Welcome to Monday. It's a fluids. So uh, we're starting to get into um, kind of the area of fluids where uh, we're going to be, I don't know, covering a lot of different things that uh, are, I don't know, I would say the, the area of fluids that maybe you are most likely to come into contact with in your future career in some way or another, um, which I think is kind of fun. We're starting to get into the point where hopefully we'll be able to be doing some more demonstrations and videos and stuff, because I think some of the stuff we're going to be coming up, up to is more visual and tangible. So I think that's that should be kind of fun too. Um, what we're going to do today is finish talking about, uh, really we'll finish with chapter six today. Uh, and then on Wednesday, Wednesday we should have a fun demo. So make sure you come on Wednesday. Um, you know, it's at least fun for me. But that's coming up Wednesday. So what we talked about on Friday, uh, we looked a little bit at Euler's equation, which is. I'm going to write the simplified version for the vector version. Um, sorry, minus gradient of pressure. So we looked at this equation. We kind of learned two separate things from it. We said if we look at this equation instead of in x, y, z coordinates, if we look at it in these streamline coordinates, we can look at along a streamline, which was the S direction. And we found um, the, the VDS equals minus G the ZDS minus one over the density the pressure D S. Right, this is uh, that same equation written along the S direction. The uh, just the thing to note, so like this isn't totally lost, right? This material derivative turns into this because by definition there is no velocity component normal to the streamline in either like the n direction or the x direction like those are zero because streamlines that's tangent to the velocity so the entire velocity is in the streamline in the s direction that's why those other terms that's why we choose this coordinate system and that's why those terms drop away uh, this tells us Right, that velocity velocity goes up as pressure goes down. So we're going to be accelerating towards areas of low pressure. Uh, we also looked normal to our streamlines in the end direction and got uh, really the exact same equation. Um, that uh, the acceleration normal to the streamline is minus G dz dn. Um, plus, sorry, minus one over rho d pressure the end. So this told us something about how uh, the how as streamlines are kind of bending, that would be an acceleration in the normal direction. We are kind of bending away from high pressure toward areas of low pressure. So if we looked at curved streamlines like this, uh, we're going to have low pressure inside of that curve. 
and high pressure on the outside of that curve. Right, you're, you're bending away from high pressure towards areas of low pressure. Uh, so that's kind of two different ways that we can think about how pressure is affecting flow. Um, we're going to be accelerating towards areas of low pressure. We're going to be bending towards areas of low pressure. I mean, both kind of make sense, right? Like low pressure is going to kind of suck things toward it. Um, high pressure is going to be pushing things away from it. Um, so that's good. That all makes sense. The uh, perhaps, uh, and we use this to, to kind of say, okay, how does this help us visualize again, putting together with things like uh, the stream function where we know that the flow rate between any two streamlines is constant. How can this help us put together a better picture of uh, visually what we're seeing with kind of what we can, what information we can interpret and what we can kind of build out of this. What we're going to do today is go back to, to this equation. Uh, we're going to look at what happens, again, in, in some more mathematical detail along, along a streamline as we go down it. Along a streamline, we have EV, I'm just going to rewrite that equation, uh, plus G, BZ, BS, plus 1 over rho, BPDS equals 0. So this is a true mathematical equation. This is basically just rewrite. This is, is just rewriting this top equation, just moving everything over to the left-hand side. This is the equation, right? It's F equals MA. It's built from Navier-Stokes. The only difference is we said this is without viscosity. So this is no, viscosity is not playing a role. Uh, but we can imagine this equation kind of governing F equals MA for a particle as it moves along. So let's picture that particle moving some small distance in space. How small, well, really small, let's call it DS. So let's picture this particle which is traveling along the streamline, obeying this equation the whole time. It's moving some small distance DS. Right, it's going to be, by definition, moving along the streamline. We can then rewrite this equation like this. Plus 1 over rho. The pressure df times ds equals zero. You can think about the same thing mathematically as just saying we multiply both sides by ds and the zero killed off the one side and we multiplied every term by ds on the other side. Um, now kind of a cool thing happens. If we look at any of these terms here, for example, this one is just equivalent to dv, right? The ds's would cancel out. Uh, this is the change in speed. Um, along s, so it's the change in the speed in that direction, in the streamline direction. This is dz which is change in height and along S. So we move this small distance, we change some speed, 
we changed height, we changed over here pressure. Change in pressure along S. So we can rewrite our top equation as V dV plus G dZ plus one over rho d pressure equals zero. Then this is kind of fun because this is a super easy equation to integrate, right? We can integrate each of these different terms. So we would integrate then this term, this term, this term. The integral of V dV is one half V squared. Gravity is approximately constant in height. So G is going to be a constant. Uh, so that will be just G. Uh, Z. And the same thing here, uh, density is going to be approximately constant in pressure. This is one over density times pressure. Equals, okay, not equals zero equals a constant. This is, if the Navier-Stokes is the most famous equation of fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics, this is number two, or if this is number one, Navier-Stokes is number two, uh, this is called the Bernoulli equation. And it's important because of its uh, simplicity, but also how many situations it it applies for and how easy it is to get from this to kind of a basic conceptual picture of how uh, velocity, pressure, and height relate to each other. So what this is saying is this sum, one half V squared plus GZ plus pressure over density, that sum has to be constant along a streamline. So this applies only along a streamline. This assumes It assumes no viscosity. So viscosity is like our friction in a fluid. This assumes that there is no friction in a fluid. So essentially what this is telling us is basically it's restating conservation of energy. So what forms of mechanical energy can you have if you're a fluid particle? Well, you can have kinetic, one half V squared. You can have potential, gravity times Z or you can have pressure energy, P. Um, so those are the different types of energy that you might have as a fluid particle and your total energy, your total mechanical energy has to stay constant if there are no losses. So we'll build back in, what do we do with viscous losses, right? Viscosity is a real thing. So if you have fluids moving, there's going to be some conversion of mechanical energy to heat because of viscosity. We'll build back in how that works. But if there's not, if viscosity doesn't matter too much, then right, conversion from one form of mechanical energy like pressure to another form of mechanical energy like velocity has to follow this equation. So this gives us a lot of, um, a lot of ways where we can kind of look at a fluid flow and be able to look at how these 
uh, these things would actually relate uh, to do things that up to this point have just been givens. For example, when we uh, the uh, the homework or the sorry, a lot of the homeworks that we did for chapter four, where we looked at say like a fire hose. And we knew the pressure on one side of the fire hose and we knew the velocity and then we figured out, you know, how the forces involved in it and things like that. We always had to be given what the pressure was and the velocity, right? We had to like know what those things were beforehand and then we could figure out and calculate forces and things like that. We could use Bernoulli's equation to predict what pressure do we need like inside of the hose to get the velocity that we need outside of the hose. Because we know, right, a fluid particle flying through that nozzle has to obey this equation. So if we know the velocity that it has inside the hose, we know the velocity that it has outside of the hose, we know the pressure inside, or we don't know the pressure inside, but we know the pressure outside is atmospheric, for example. We can use Bernoulli's equation to be able to figure out like what pressure did it have to have inside, uh, instead of just that being a given. Right. So if you if you need to know um, or if you know what pressure you have, like I, I know I have a, a hose that's at 300 kilopascals. If I poke a hole in it, how fast is the water going to shoot out? Uh, you can use this equation to be able to figure out things like that. It's we'll do an example here in a second, uh, but this is basically Well, this is I'll not right. Basically, this is conservation so So this is uh, fluid flow with, with no losses, with no conversion of mechanical energy to heat, for example, no friction. So let's look at a quick example. Uh, an example that you guys all know and love. So, If you remember this problem fondly, there's this pipe and it's 0 0.9 meters and it has a radius of curvature here of r equals 0 0.6 meters. Remember this from the homework? Uh, we knew the pressure, right, we had a pressure gauge here. Uh, P equals 34.5 kilopascal. And we were given in the homework, we were given what the pressure, um, right? So if we were given the pressure, or we, we had to find the pressure here, right? P2. And you, uh, okay, so this is P1. You guys found this because you knew statics, um, right? So you just, you calculated this, we calculated rho GH, and we hoped that we were correct. You were correct. Uh, if we picture, it's a little bit different than a normal, sta normal statics problem because you do have movement. You don't have everything just sitting there with zero velocity. But if you picture a streamline going up, I missed, oh no, it's terrible. Okay, if you picture a streamline going up through there, right, this is our, it's 
streamlined. Uh, Bernoulli's equation tells us that P1, sorry, tells us that uh, I'll write it in the same form. So V1, one half V1 squared plus G Z1 plus P1 divided by density. This tells us that this is true. V2 squared plus G Z2 plus P2 over rho. That if we're at the same point along a streamline, these two things must be equal to each other. Uh, so if A1 equals A2, then conservation of mass says that V1 is equal to V2. Then we could simply simplify, we could simplify this down to be G Z1 plus P1 over rho equals G Z2 plus P2 over rho or uh, P P1 minus P2 equals rho G Z2 minus Z1. Okay, so the difference in pressure is equal to just rho GH. Okay. We could have also used this to figure out, um, so the quiz that we did where we had like velocity, we had uh, a big pipe going to a smaller pipe. So because of that change in diameter, we had an increase in speed. Uh, I used Bernoulli's equation to figure out what the pressure is on each side of that joint. So you can figure out, okay, if we have this change in speed and there are no losses from viscosity, what is the change in pressure across that? spot. Uh, so we'll be able to use it like that. We also often use Bernoulli's equation for uh, kind of pressure measuring uh, because it gives us, right, there are kind of two different ways to think about um, fluids, right? Bernoulli's equation is like a total mechanical energy picture. Uh, so we can measure that actually pretty directly, which is kind of cool. So if we think about um, if we think about mechanical energy of a fluid, if we look at it. One of these terms here is pressure. Uh, the other is like gravity and velocity. So this gives us kind of two different. Like we can talk about the, the mechanical energy that the fluid has. Uh, if we can convert, say, the velocity into pressure. Uh, so I'll, let me talk a little bit about what that would look like. Static. Um, stagnation and dynamic pressure. Uh, so there are kind of a couple different ways that we can think about pressure and measurement of the mechanical energy of a fluid. So the first one is static pressure. Static pressure is, um, normal pressure. It's the, like, if you think of pressure, what is the pressure? If that's static pressure. Right, this is 
is P This is the this is the pressure in the Bernoulli equation. This is P. Uh, when we measure static pressure, we would measure it uh, something like this. So we would have a a flow and down here we would measure the pressure perpendicular to that flow so for example, if you have a pipe and you have like liquid flowing through the pipe, you'd put your pressure gauge perpendicular, like sideways sticking off of the pipe. So this is trying to, to show with my picture, right? How you normally, when you've encountered a pressure gauge on something, that's how you normally have looked at the, uh, like, right, it's a pressure gauge on a pipe. It's always sitting off perpendicularly from the side of the pipe. That's um, so that would be measuring static pressure. Um, it would be similar to measuring, right? It's measuring the pressure of a non moving fluid. So the fluid, like here, down here, is not moving anywhere, right? It's static. That's why we call it static pressure. Another way that you can measure this, this is and we'll call mode A. Um, Again, the same idea, you're always trying to measure perpendicular. Another device that you can use is like a little, um, that's a bad picture. Like a probe that you can hold up. This is often used for measuring, uh, well, either liquids or gases a little like probe that you can hold up into the flow. So you have fluid flowing this way, kind of around the, um, the object. And what you have is like a closed end, but you have little like slits kind of in the side. So you have little holes again, perpendicular to the flow. So what you're measuring is not like, so fluid's not going, flowing directly into those holes. You're measuring always perpendicular to the direction of the flow. Uh, if you're doing that, whether you're using like a normal pressure gauge on the side of a pipe, or you're like sticking your little probe, but again, having the hole, the holes perpendicular so you don't have fluid like going directly into there, you're measuring static pressure. Uh, okay, so the second one uh, is called stagnation pressure. This is um, really a measure of total fluid energy, fluid mechanical energy. So we convert um, velocity to pressure by um, by decelerating the fluid to 
zero speed. So we take our moving fluid and decelerate it to zero velocity. Uh, and that gives us a measure of kind of the total fluid mechanical energy, or really the pressure plus velocity. It's not measuring potential energy. Uh, so let's look a little bit at how that would, would look. Uh, so if we would have like pressure, um, plus zero squared over two, because we're accelerating. So this would be our final thing. This is uh, this is our stagnation pressure, P naught. Um, that's the, the variable name typically used for it plus G Z zero equals uh, P over rho plus B squared over two plus G Z. So if um, Z naught is about equal to Z, then those terms cancel out and the stagnation pressure is equal to pressure over rho plus one half V squared. Or sorry, that's equal rho. It's because of that. I missed the rho on the left. Okay, so that's correct. Um, so this tells us, um, kind of, again, it's a measurement of the total mechanical energy. So if you look at your fluid that's moving, it has, uh, really three forms of mechanical energy. It has pressure energy, it has kinetic energy, and it has potential energy. This doesn't count the potential energy. Uh, but this here is, right, this is the static pressure. Uh, this here we call the dynamic pressure. This is Ke converted to pressure, right? Because we stopped our fluid, we converted all of that kinetic energy into pressure energy. That's the dynamic pressure. Now, okay, how would we how would we measure that? Um, we would do something to uh, to stop the fluid, or we can say if the fluid comes to a stop, that's what the pressure is going to be. So let's do um, get black. Just a quick example from the problem that we looked at on Friday. So we had a wing look something like this. And we had fluid flowing over the wing. All right, so fluid is coming. That's a bad one. Okay, something like that. Uh, there were two in the picture that we do that we looked at. It was better than the drawing that I'm about to do. But the the air that's coming right at the front leading edge of the wing. We saw two streamlines coming in toward the front leading edge of the wing, and they slowly kind of bent apart. They separated because the velocity was going down. Basically, the fluid that's coming right at the center of the wing is going to come, and it's going to come and crash right into that wing and come to a stop. So you're going to have fluid coming down this way toward the wing, and it's going to crash right into the, maybe it's up here, it's going to crash right into the front leading edge and basically come to a stop in the like left-right direction. 
Um, but it's basically going to come to a complete stop as it gets to that front front surface of the wing. Um, so we saw that there was a high pressure at that front leading edge because the air is coming in, crashing to a stop, slowing down. We saw that made the streamlines kind of separate and then go around the wing. Um, we can calculate the pressure at that front leading edge. Um, if we know, right, P naught equals P plus rho one half B squared. Uh, so that's going to characterize the stagnation, pr the pressure at the stagnation point. Um, right, and that just means air. comes to a stop. So we can characterize that if we know um, the static pressure is atmospheric or whatever it happens to be. We'll say it's 100 kilopascal. Uh, we'll say the velocity of the plane is 60 meters per second. So that's not super fast, but uh, and then the density of air is 1.23 kilograms per meters cubed at standard temperature and pressure. So we could calculate the pressure at the leading at the wing tip um, using Bernoulli's equation, right? This pressure is going to be equal to P plus one half or rho one half B squared. So our stagnation pressure is going to be equal to 100 kPa plus 1.23 kilogram per meter cubed uh, times one half times 60 <clears throat> meters per second squared. We have to do a little bit with our units. So the units on this, uh, a kilopascal equals a uh, equals 1,000 newtons per square meter. Uh, and we have kilogram per meter cubed uh, times meters squared per second squared. So that's one Newton per square meter. Uh, so we can write P naught equals 100 kPa plus 1.23 times one half, 60 squared, and then divide by a thousand to get from Pascals and to get into everything in kilopascals. This would give us a stagnation pressure of 102.2 kPa. We could use the same kind of arguments to calculate if we knew the if we wanted to know the pressure at the top surface of the wing, where the velocity is say gone from 60 meters per second if it's gone up to 100 meters per second. So at So this would be not using stagnation pressure, this would just be using Bernoulli's. Um,
would be 1 squared over 2 plus gz1. So there's not a huge change in height, so there's not going to be a huge change in potential energy. Um, basically, rho gh is not very big. So uh, essentially, we can look at the conversion. This would be 100, um, or we'll do everything in pascals. So this is 100 um, newtons per meter squared divided by 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed plus 60 meters per second squared over two. That would be the energy that the air has coming in before it's encountered the wing. And then at the top surface of the wing, it will be some new pressure divided by 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed plus now our new velocity, 100 meters per second squared over two. So we could figure out this new pressure at the top surface of the wing. If we did that, we get pressure two is 96.1 kilopascals. So we, we dipped from 100 kilopascals initially, we dipped in static pressure down to 96 because our velocity went up. So these two things are always going to be, these three things, pressure, velocity, height, are always going to be in balance. And if you lose one, you gain one of the others. Um, the only way you lose kind of all three is if you change the total mechanical energy because of friction. The last thing that uh, you may run across that is kind of a, a cool and direct result of Bernoulli's equation is a really easy way for measuring velocity um, from the stagnation pressure. So Alternatively, you can, from the velocity, you can say, what's the pressure at the front surface of this object going to be at the stagnation point? Um, so if we have a system like this, um, okay, where We have a, um, a system where we have a flow here. But some of that flow is parallel to, uh, say, an opening. Fluid is going to flow into that opening and then down this way and then Right, if we force it to come to a stop, basically it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna come, and stop moving. That's going to give the stagnation pressure here. So we'll draw, uh, so P equals uh, plus rho one half V squared on that side. Uh, on this other side here, 
Uh, if we combine that with a, just a measure, a normal measurement, quote unquote, normal measurement of pressure, this side is just going to be the static pressure. If we connect these two sides like this, uh, and say, fill it with a liquid, um, we can look at the pressure, right? The pressure pushing on the left-hand side is going to be just the static pressure. The pressure pushing on the right-hand side is going to be the static pressure plus the, extra, the dynamic pressure, plus this extra pressure from velocity. It's going to be the stagnation pressure. Uh, that's going to give a different pressure on each side. We can measure that pressure difference uh, in a manometer from because there's going to be a difference in height on the two sides of that thing. And we can use that to go backwards and figure out what the velocity must have been. Um, right, so our velocity V is going to be equal to, right, if we just solve this equation, it's going to be the square root of 2 P naught minus P divided by density with P naught minus P, right? What is the pressure difference on those, on the two sides of our manometer? It's just rho GH, rho um, GH. So the tricky part is this is the density of, um, The manometer fluid. This is the density of the moving fluid. Uh, so that's kind of the, the tricky thing is to figure out which density is which. Right, but the cool thing is, okay, you can just take a, a really simple a piece of equipment and use that to be able to measure velocity. This system is called a uh, a pitot tube. They're used really pretty widely um, Throughout engineering, they're used in airplanes a lot to measure velocity. So you can put them on like different portions of uh, like the aircraft body to be able to measure velocities in different places. They're used a lot in uh, like if you need accurate readings of velocity at a certain like point location, this is way more accurate than using like a, a little fan blade or something like that. Like you can put this. They're, you can make them really small tubes so they don't disrupt like what's happening around it very much. And you can insert that and like hold your little wand wherever you want to measure the velocity and get like a, a point velocity. What's the velocity at this exact point? And be able to, to move that around really easily, get accurate velocity measurements at wherever you happen to be, you know, putting this little end here in your flow. So because of that, they're used really often. Um, if you want to go over and walk past our wind tunnel, this is how we measure the velocity. We have a pitot tube sitting in the wind tunnel um, that you guys used in intro to measure velocity uh, in there. So they're used really often, um, but basically they just rely on this, this difference between, uh, basically they rely on conservation of energy in order to work. And the fact that if you can, if you convert velocity, you can convert that directly into pressure just by slowing a fluid down to a stop. Um, 
So we'll uh, build in some losses and more fun things like that. We'll start to talk a little bit more about uh, fluid flow next time and bring back like the whole Navier-Stokes equation instead of this simple version that doesn't have viscosity. We'll do that a little bit to see how that works. Um, but yeah, make sure you come next time to class because it'll be, we have a kind of a fun demo coming up. So look forward to that. Right, have a good Monday. Thank you.